Hey, this is Mark Pugh, and welcome to the Upload. I have with me my friend Carlos Giron, a physician in Macon. Uh, I don't remember exactly how we got in touch with each other, whether you stalked me on LinkedIn or I stalked you. Do you remember how we got in touch? Actually, uh, I think we met at a uh, conference you were speaking at, and um, years later became connected through LinkedIn, and uh, the mutual stalking began after that. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> yeah, well, I can say I knew you before you were famous, because you're famous now. You're, you're that middle Georgia guy that gives out CBD. Oh, gosh. Well, if, if that's my claim to fame, then I, I guess I'll take that. <laughs> So, in the past discussions we've had, I know that you started out as a cynic, and in fact, you actually never sampled marijuana when you were in college Correct. or in high school or anything like that. So, you've done somewhat of a 180 um, over your career and really over the last couple of years. Can you kind of describe that, that process and where you became someone who doesn't think marijuana is medicine to someone who's actually integrated CBD into your medical practice? Well, Mark, it, it really began in uh, a scenario where we had the push for uh, CBD to become part of a treatment option for children having uh, seizures. So the pediatric seizure disorders were being addressed by a local legislator uh, who was from Macon, uh, Alan Peake. And when he started doing the, the push and there was a bit of a media onslaught, I had a number of patients who came to me and started asking about the legalization of marijuana and is this something that they were eligible for. Um, inevitably I began to do a good deal of research on it uh, so that I could answer their questions to the best uh, extent that I, that I could possibly find. And what we ended up arriving at was a conclusion that after so many patients would come to me um, that this was something that had some, some legitimacy. Uh, because many of them, as I like to say, would ask for permission, but some would ask for forgiveness and would say that they had tried CBD that had been brought to them by a family member from out California or Colorado way, or that they had been over vacationing in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon or in Washington, and that they had seen stories or even billboards and signs about this particular type of treatment. So it's some tried CBD in earnest and some tried full-on marijuana and the number of patients was just increasing along the way many of whom would tell me about the benefits that they ended up seeing and when they started handing me back prescriptions for sleep medications and opioids and anti-inflammatories and muscle relaxants I started to really my ears started to perk up I got very uh, excited at the possibility because this was already what I was trying to do and was succeeding to a fair extent, but now this was potentially a new tool in my uh, arsenal that I could utilize. And you're a pain management physician by, by education and practice, right? Absolutely. What is your specialty? Um, I, I trained as an anesthesiologist with interventional pain management subspecialty training. So, you know, I've been in practice now for 23 years and have been 100% pain management now for a little over 20 years. Uh, so during that time, uh, my, the spectrum of my career has run from the very beginning of the opioid epidemic, as it turned out, where we had pain that was undertreated. We had governmental agencies who were pushing physicians and telling us that we needed to treat pain aggressively. We had the pharmaceutical industry bringing out these new uh, extended release types of or medications and opioids that had no ceiling, so they said. You could titrate the dose until you got the effective pain relief, and they were safer and non-addictive. Mm. Well, we came to find out later that wasn't exactly not exactly the case. sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with that, the the spectrum of my career spectrum of my career has gone from that point where pain was undertreated to really the 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 inevitable, which was that pain became overtreated and opioids were prescribed uh, over prescribed. So now the, the next turn, the next pivot in my career was the trying to bring those doses down. So long before the CDC issued opioid guidelines in 2016, I had already begun opioid reductions and weans and taper strategies for my patients, uh, which is easier in, in, sound, in, in its theory than it is in practice. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that I found was that I needed to incorporate as much as I could to try to help those patients to come off of opioids. Um, that included engaging them in a healthy lifestyle, 
and having them be able to do exercise and move body parts that had been previously injured and it hurts to do that so they're very resistant but at the same time you're telling them that they need to bring their opioid doses down and when I visited you at your clinic it was uh, interesting to see the the aqua therapy that you had yes. and the kind of behavioral therapy so you're not a kind of just all drug interventional and I remember you telling me in the aqua therapy that there is a certain degree temperature um, yes. that is best suited for someone that can't be weight bearing uh, to help them kind of get used to that that motion can you kind of describe how the aqua therapy kind of goes into that whole thing as absolutely. well absolutely we, we actually incorporated aquatic therapy into our practice by building a heated pool in our practice in our physical therapy department uh, 18 years ago and when we did that we were able to incorporate the I guess you could call it the buoyancy uh, the natural buoyancy of the human body uh, to offset some of the gravitational effects so now you had less weight uh, being in, uh, an impact on the spine and on the joints that were hurting all these patients. So now they can move easier, uh, they're lulled into a false sense of security because the water feels good mm -hmm. and in so doing they're actually working against the resistance of the water. Plus they're moving more than they would have out on land like, like we are here. And what we found that is that during that time that they were in the pool they were putting more work in than they ever in, anticipated so a day or two later, inevitably, they would call and say, hey, by the way, I'm hurting more. The therapy's hurting me. And we came to the conclusion over time that they were not actually hurting more. It was there was a soreness because they hadn't moved these body parts in so long. Mm -hmm. That good pain versus bad pain kind that of thing. That was the good pain. Mm -hmm. That was what they had to work through to get to the other side of where they were, mm -hmm. uh, which was essentially motionless and, and, as I like to call it, the arthritis, the rust was building up in those joints, muscles, and tendons. And now every time that they would move a little more, they started to feel better. And like I said, they would ramp up to that plateau where it just didn't hurt as much, and now they could push on through. And when they did that, those folks became the proponents for aquatic therapy. And they got memberships over at wellness centers and at gyms, sometimes on their own dime, sometimes on their insurance uh, um, companies, but at the same time, they became dedicated. And I have some folks who are so gung-ho about it that they will actually spend six days a week in the pool exercising at their respective gyms and wellness centers. And if it was open the seventh day, they would be there for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they benefited from, from it so much that they became almost evangelists uh, to, to other patients, to other family members. And lo and behold, it, the program grew. And now we have patients who are actually training patients at outside gyms, which is kind of crazy. Oh, that's cool. But it's really nice to see that because they help and coach each other along the way, and they have that buddy system set mm -hmm. up uh, so that they encourage each other. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the 12th step of the 12-step program is really to pay it forward, right? And that, I've seen that in recovery with a lot of the connections that I've had on social media where people who are in active, successful recovery, and they're constantly mentoring other people. So it sounds like someone found that the warm pool helped facilitate better movement and that good pain actually is a good thing. I'm assuming that you have somewhat evangelist on the CBD as well because I know in our discussions um, you have used that for five or six hundred patients over the past year or so to help them wean off of opioids, wean off of benzos and by doing so they don't have the symptomatology of the constipation and the uh, um, you know, all the other things that come with it, anxiety. So I'm assuming that when people see that, they understand that there's value to it. How do you, it, so if someone's coming into your office and goes, hey, somebody got me some good weed, or hey, here's some CBD that I bought at the 7-Eleven, uh, you've got some experience now. How do you talk through, because there's somewhat of a buyer beware right now, and that's why the FDA is trying to figure out how to deal with the CBD, because with the Farm Bill December of 2018, it just exploded and it can be bought everywhere, but you're not really sure what you're buying, you're not really sure what's on the label, if it's accurate, if it's benign, if it could be actually harmful. So when someone comes and self-procures and say they're already a patient of yours, um, they come in and they self-procure some CBD, um, and but they're also on the painkiller. How do you talk them through how this might be an adjunct to their treatment and maybe potentially help taper them off of those drugs? Well, it, it really became uh, an organic effort, no pun intended on that. <laughs> Truth be told, uh, many of those folks would, would already come to me with a product. 
Uh, so initially they were getting it from anywhere and everywhere and there was no uniformity to it. I would inevitably look at the, the, the packaging, at the labeling, at the bottle itself, and in so doing try to formulate an opinion as to whether this could or couldn't be something legitimate. Um, the recent studies that I have seen have indicated that 60% of CBD products uh, that are being sold out there don't have any CBD in them, mm. and as much as 90% of those that have a dosage uh, or concentration indicated on the label uh, that it's inaccurate. So it's the wild, wild west, and you really don't know what you're getting unless it is a third-party tested um, um, per batch type of uh, company that actually will legitimately provide that for each batch that they uh, have produced and that it's tested for for pesticides, for harmful chemicals, uh, for all the things that we would wish to avoid out there so that we don't have patients actually being injured. So I have to talk them through that and when I look at the packaging what I found was literally the wild wild west. We had labels that said FDA approved. It is That's not. a red flag. <laughs> yeah, very, very red. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I would see that, I, I would initially just judge it on the basis of that and other things, uh, not knowing whether there's a concentration that's actually in there. Some of them won't even list that. Uh, so if it doesn't have a dosage, if it doesn't have uh, the, the third-party certificate, whether it's through a QR scan, which some legitimate companies will, will provide per batch, or actually a certificate, a, a printed-out sheet in the packaging itself, or online, you really wouldn't have known what to get, what to use. And guiding my patients through that has been a big adventure uh, so that many of them began to ask me, well, where the heck can we get something that is legitimate? And in my research, I was able to find several companies uh, that are legitimate and they are at least uh, fitting those criteria and have seen some better results for the CBD uh, from those companies for my patients. So as a result, really kind of steering them away from going to the flea market to get their CBD oil or from the gas station and more toward a, a, a medicalized approach, if you will, where you know what dosage, what concentration, and then we can really uh, adjust it as if it were a full-on medication that I would be prescribing for them. So treating medicine as if it were medicine. Which, if you think of marijuana in general, it's the only medicine, if you consider it medicine, that's patient-directed, that's patient-procured. Um, there's not a lot of guidance out there in regards to that. So, as a scientist, as a, as a physician, you're a scientist by definition, right? I mean, exactly. you think of things. Um, so, w when you went through that process, and so you came into it, I won't say necessarily cynical, but you certainly didn't believe up front that marijuana was medicinal. Your patients brought... CBD in with them and say, hey, doc, I've heard great things about this. What do you think? Um, so you got not voluntarily necessarily drug into this process. What's been the outcomes for that? Because people talk about science and they talk about um, research studies and the lack of clinical studies and the lack of scientific proof. And I, my question is, how many anecdotal stories does it require in order to get to some kind of proof? So what's been your experience and your practice with coming from where you're at to where you're at right now? Well, uh, starting at zero patients and now we're over 700 patients in our practice who have been uh, able to incorporate CBD at some point during their treatment. Um, I started as a skeptic, as you said. I was somebody who um, did not believe in it being a medical approach. Number one, it was illegal. So m the first thing that any patient would ask me would, you know, regarding this, I would, I would stand at an arm's distance and say, I cannot condone anything illegal. In fact, if I were to prescribe a, a controlled substance for them, according to the state of Georgia, I would be uh, committing uh, unprofessional conduct and could lose my license. Mm. So in that light, I would always steer them away from anything that was illegal. But I had really an increasing number of legitimate patients, folks who I had known for 15 years sometimes, or more and who had been through multiple surgeries and I'd seen the suffering that they'd gone through just to get to the point where they were stable enough to live in everyday life and when these folks started coming in and actually having tried it and seen that their sleep was better which is a very underrated part of, of life and treatment and pain management and too. pain management mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. question uh, their anxiety got better and their inflammation got better and those were folks who I know 
were doing things right and were wanting to come off of opioids. When those patients would hand back to me a prescription for a sleep medicine and say, I no longer need it, I'm sleeping through the night, or they would actually tell me, Doc, you can cut that down a little bit further, I don't need as much pain medication, that really got my attention. I couldn't ignore it after a given point where I just said, this has something to it that I can't account for. And along the way, I had been doing a fair bit of research so that I knew that there is some science behind this. Not only a body of medical uh, evidence, uh, but there is actual scientific uh, proof as to the endocannabinoid system where these chemicals can actually take effect and exert physiologic and oftentimes psychologic effects. So that during my medical training, we didn't know about the endocannabinoid system. We knew about the opioid uh, system and the receptors that were present in our body and our, our own production of endorphins, which is our own natural opiates. But what we didn't know was that there was a similar system set up for the, the, the cannabis types of chemicals. Mm -hmm. And the endocannabinoid system is where this takes place, exerting effects on sleep, on homeostasis, on uh, anxiety and pain and inflammation, and all of this now has a scientific basis. Well, that definitely was a game changer for a lot of folks along the way who think of it from a systematic, organized, and scientific approach. And when I started to actually bring that into being, where I now told my patients, I need you to bring me the dose, I need the concentration, I need to know what it is that you're ingesting, and we're going to bring that down to an absolute dosage medicalizing it was the game changer where now I could systematically approach it and look at it and say, okay, well this is the right dose for you and this might be too much, this might be too little, this won't interact with your medications. Looking at it from, from a clinician standpoint instead of from just being a skeptic or you know somebody looking at it from the outside in, mm -hmm. I, I began to weave it into the fabric of my everyday treatment. And those, pa those patients have done phenomenally well. Um, I would estimate that 90 plus percent have had a clinical benefit and I would define that as improvements in their sleep pattern, in their anxiety, pain, or inflammation. Those four major categories. I don't get 90 plus percent response rate for anything that I've done in my 23 year career. Mm -hmm. So that certainly got my attention and really it became, it might be an anecdotal body of evidence but let's not mistake the anecdotal part because the evidence is there. And in my practice, the evidence has been there. Uh, so I may not be a multi-center um, university level study, but I can tell you that what I have seen as a skeptic, as a boots on the ground, actual treating physician who wanted to see an option for my patients, this became something that really greatly surprised me. Mm -hmm. And I think the term medicalization is so key to that because that's part of the stigma still associated with marijuana and to a large degree it still is that it's self-procured, that it's up to the patient to figure out what, there's no dosage, there's no duration, frequency formulation, there's no guidance given to that. Um, New York and Minnesota both have pharmacists that are required to be a part of the dispensary so there's at least a little bit of science, but if you go do a bud tender in a dispensary in Denver or in LA, you know, they're probably users, um, not scientists associated with that. So I think the fact that you have figured out that equal balance between the medicalization and trying to make it act and feel and touch and taste like medicine um, is really key to a scientist that, that and, has skepti healthy skepticism. And not only that, but the, the patient now looks at it more seriously. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the, the things that I, I was somewhat taken aback by. Because now they understood that, oh, this isn't something that I just go ahead and put a few drops under my tongue whenever I feel like it. There's actually a, a scientific basis for why we would use this once or twice a day. Why we're going to use it in a dosing protocol that might go anywhere from 0.1 milligrams per kilogram on up to more than that. And, and that th those clinical effects will vary so that I have been able to see a wide range of effects. And one of the biggest questions that I have for any patient before I initiate therapy is, are you cannabis naive? Have you ever used any form of cannabis in the past? And one of the things that you find out is that if you start too low on somebody, you're kind of wasting time. Mm. 
So initially I would start everyone very low at the lowest possible doses and build up very slowly. Um, found out that those folks obviously are going to be a little bit ready for the next dose and very quickly adapted with them to, to find that, that sweet spot for them, as I like to call it, gold deluxe dose. Mm -hmm. and, and it does vary. So what may be a 0.1 milligram per kilogram dose for a cannabis naive patient may end up being closer to a milligram per kilogram for someone who has had exposure in the past. And we're not talking about heavy marijuana users. We're talking about folks who had some recreational use in the past. Uh, but certainly in Georgia, our program is limited to essentially CBD-rich and low-THC oils uh, as, as the majority of the treatment mm -hmm. that's available. So I have a variety of people that view these videos and listen to the, the, my musings, um, so to speak. Um, so I'd like for you to spend 30 seconds and speak to physicians and then spend 30 seconds and speak to patients. And it's kind of the takeaway, the one thing that you would like physicians, scientists, other folks just like you that maybe have already drunk the Kool-Aid or maybe you're still healthy skeptics, may have smoked marijuana when they're in college and so they have kind of experience or maybe like you had never sampled marijuana whatsoever. In 30 seconds, kind of encapsulate for them what you would like them to take away from our time together. Most definitely. I think that what's important about it is having an open mind being able to do your own research, being able to uh, access the data that is out there. There's a, a healthy body of uh, literature out of Israel. Um, the research of Yasmin Hurd uh, showing uh, cannabis to be a neuroprotectant and antioxidant is extremely important. Uh, so with that, what we're looking at is a harm reduction strategy and util utilizing something like that to be able to bring down opioid doses I think is critical. I've been able to do so to the tune of 65% reduction in opioids when you compare the morphine equivalent daily doses um, from several years back to now. So that in and of, uh, in and of itself uh, really is an evidence that I can't um, ignore and have to basically uh, be evangelistic about. Uh, as far as patients, I think what needs to be said is that this is something that should not just be done, uh, gone about in a willy-nilly fashion. Uh, this needs to have a physician's guidance. Uh, I think that the states that are bringing in pharmacists into the fold, I think that's very good, but a pharmacist has never actually treated a patient. They may provide a service, but they don't have the, the training that a physician who at least puts forth the effort to bring about uh, getting as much information and as much research done as possible would be able to bring to the table. Um, so keep in mind that as a medication, CBD oil or marijuana, depending on your state, would have different implications as far as potential interactions with other medications. And that could, in and of itself could be a dangerous uh, scenario. But I think it's very important to be able to find it from a legitimate source that is third-party tested, that will not be harmful to you. And finding it at the cheapest, most easily accessible location is probably not a great idea. So try to get some guidance from a healthcare professional who would at least know where you could access something that's safe and legitimate. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much, Carlos, for joining me. Um, it's been fun to get to know you, um, to visit in person your clinic in Macon, um, to look at some of the, 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 the results and outcomes that you've had. And certainly, you know, from my standpoint, I think anybody who makes a positive impact on people's lives and be able to get back to function and get back to living um, is a miracle worker and someone who makes change not just for that individual but their family, their friends, and maybe generations of people after that. And I know, you know, throughout your pain management career, you've had that effect. But now with the CBD, it is a game changer to some degree, and you're able to help a lot of people that you hadn't been able to help. So I, I applaud you for um, your efforts. I, I'm really glad um, to be able to count you as a friend, and I wish you great success um, in, in making and, and as you become even more and more famous around the world. <laughs> thank you so much, Mark. And I would add, thank you for your efforts in uh, helping us with opioid reduction throughout the country and educating physicians, insurers, and the public. So thank you so much for your career. Educator and agitator, that's what it's all about. Amen to that. <laughs> all right, great, thank you. Thank you.